Um, yeah, first of all, uh, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge um, my, my home territory, uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of uh, the, Cow the Cowetson people. Uh, Cowetson in our language, uh, um, in our language, uh, Cowetson means the warm land or the land warmed by the sun. And here you see a, a photo of uh, what's known as the, the Cowichan River. And uh, it, it's spectacular. And my whole family lives around this river and this is the river I grew up on. Uh, it doesn't look like that today. Uh, in, the, in the winter, that river becomes really high and really fast moving. And uh, in our Cowichan um, uh, tradition, uh, this is our working season where a uh, number of people, a number of families will be in our big house uh, doing doing work. And uh, this is the time when um, uh, some of our members are finding their traditional names and they're they're being grounded in our cowets and uh, traditions and protocols and culture. and And our big house sits right next to this river. And as I say, it's big and it's rushing and Every morning, uh, uh, and members are, are dipped into that river at 5 a.m. And uh, this is the river that provides us uh, that spiritual connection uh, and uh, is also our, our food source. Um, so I wanted to, to acknowledge that territory and call that in um, to our discussion today. And uh, the next slide, I wanted to also acknowledge uh, the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh uh, people. This is my new home. Uh, I'm coming to you this morning from tsleil territory. I live uh, in a place called Ravenwoods, which is a housing project uh, owned by the nation. So you, still, you see I'm still really close to the water, but a different kind of uh, source of water. This is big ocean community. Uh, and it's absolutely, absolutely stunning. I'm so privileged to be here uh right now especially i get to enjoy the forest and these waters every day and uh for those that um aren't familiar slay which is uh is also um uh known as north vancouver very very close to uh deep cove uh vancouver british columbia and uh the next slide please thanks so much yeah, so I, I just wanted to say um, I, I'm incredibly honored uh, that you would invite me to share space with you um, as you kick off a new year. Um, I don't know about you, but um, I'm I'm filled with an odd feeling, um, and I've lost track of how to articulate it in terms of sensation because it's been so long. But I think it might be optimism <laughs> um but i know these are distressing times um but yeah i i'm feeling reflective at the moment about transformation and transition and change and how it feels how it feels for us um i feel like sometimes there's places in the world and in life where it's hard to tell what's a sunrise or a sunset. And I think that's because one naturally leads to the other. Um, you know, these cycles that we live in and that live within us, I think are an important meditation to keep us grounded in the present, you know, the here and the now, uh, to appreciate what we have and to remember these energy movements um, are a gift to be experienced and seasons and lunar cycles and all of us, we're in this um, terrific uh, state of transformation. And we have the ability um, to make our experience a deep and meaningful one if we can be resilient um, and by which I mean adaptable and flexible and creative about how we want to dance through it. Um, so I, I'm here to share a message with you <laughs> as uh, as you brave forward in this brave new world for you Aldous Huxley fans. Um, I named I actually named my cat Huxley because 
um, I'm that obsessed with our kind of utopian and dystopian potentials. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I wanted to talk a bit about how our world is being shaped and who and what are shaping it. And um, I, I mean that both in physical and virtual spaces, but um, in this case, I'm really pointing to the virtual digital world we're all now almost completely immersed in. Um, and I think we knew this immersion was coming, but I, I don't think that we predicted this hyper acceleration. And um, I, I'm guessing you've noticed um, some of the troubling things about that, um, you know, how tech companies are the most resource rich and powerful entities in the world um, beyond what any government can regulate, uh, how our reliance is absolute our participation mandatory, and um, our, our questions about the use of our data or the impact of this immersion into technology on our lives has not really been answered. And, um, you know, this is the problem for us digitally privileged people, but while we think about the intrusion of technology in our lives, uh, there's an incredible number of people in this country that don't have basic access. And um, here in BC, 75% of First Nations communities don't have access to, to broadband. And the, bro the broadband definition um, is, is a 50 megabit download speed and a 10 megabit upload speed. So 75% of BC First Nations don't have access to that, which is required for basic streaming or even connecting uh, like this. So, so think about how that excludes people. It's awful. I mean, we're talking about maybe a quarter of a million people disconnect BC alone. And, and this is a problem across, across the country. And, and for Indigenous peoples, um, this is a continuation of a 150-year-long um, tradition of Canada excluding, isolating, and refusing uh, Indigenous peoples the right to participate in society and the economy. Uh, but now online and virtually. And, you know, we've, we've been on a trajectory for a long time that has made this possible, uh, actually for over 100 years. And the short story is this in Canada, um, railroads, telephony, and internet infrastructure and use have been governed and regulated the same way in this country since 1906. Um, the underlying premise of which is that only communities with the greatest economic growth potential, therefore density and return on investment uh, will be connected. And as a country, we've struggled ever since to square equity of access for all citizens with this underlying belief system that only some communities are worth connecting. So when you read back in the history and the literature, you see that this was about, uh, you know, in the 1920s and 30s about farmers not getting connected because Bell Canada and others didn't see a reason to connect farmers. They only wanted to connect where the railway stops were because that's where the economic growth was. And so now look at what's happening here. I mean, we're now talking about Northern communities, uh, indigenous peoples, but it's the same, but it's the same. Um, this, this structural oppression, you know, has, has really come home to roost in 2020. You know, when these small Northern communities, um, many which are indigenous have not had the ability uh, to transition into this online uh, environment. So suddenly, you know, uh, government promises to have all Canadians connected by 2035. It isn't good enough. It wasn't good enough before, but it really isn't good enough now. Um, so why is it still a problem? You know, why don't we all have access? And the answer is that we're relying on a model uh, driven by capitalism to solve it, and it won't. So, you know, it's that old cliche that the um, 
the thinking that got us into this mess won't get us out. You know, it's that. But um, these companies are too, you know, they're they're too huge, and governments have been um, really ill-equipped to imagine something different. Um, basically, what we see is uh, the tacking on of funding programs around the edges, um, which ultimately feed the fire of the same broken model. You know, so so we ask, you know, where's the intervening? Where's the intervening place here? How do how do we, the people, raise our collective hand and say, um, we would like everyone to have access, you know, so that this virtual space can be designed by people who actually care about the ethical side of this and will advance our society and culture in a good way you know, not exploit us for data and get us glued to notifications and convince us that staring at this app and buying everything on Amazon is, is going to make us happy or fulfilled. And I believe that we, the people, deserve a seat at this decision-making table uh, when, it come, when it comes especially to building technology into our lives. And I, I say all the time that innovation is dependent on a diversity of thought and it's time for us to require new voices in this discussion which is actively shaping our future as human beings advancing rapidly into uncharted technological integration and and living on a struggling struggling planet you know for for me Personally, my organization uh, and my efforts are all about Indigenous peoples being in leadership positions at all levels of this conversation, um, because it's time for transition and transformation. You know, it's time for voices that can inform the world about how to build humanity, ethics, and care into our technological future. And to stand those voices up, you know, I want to better understand how can we code in values and integrity into our future and how to make connectivity really mean human connectivity. Um, I mean, you only have to watch one Black Mirror episode to know what I mean or why this is important, uh, you know. Um, but I, I like how uh, Charles Eisenstein puts it, um, you know, it's the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. So to get there, um, we just have to start with the understanding that some belief systems and models need to sunset while others must embark on their sunrise. So. From a macro level, that's what I'm talking about. And from the work you see us doing at the First Nations Technology Council, um, you can see we're running the programming and doing the work to have Indigenous talent um, ready uh, to, take up, to take up this challenge. Um, next slide, please, Mike. Uh, thanks. So the, the, the vision for the uh, First Nations Technology Council uh, and this utopian online world that I'm talking about was all created from here. Uh, one of the most important things in my life is taking really long forest walks. Uh, it always has been uh, from as far back as I can remember. It's um, my form of meditation and it helps give me deeper perspective and appreciation for the natural systems already in place. Uh, it's a good reminder also, I think, that we are small and vulnerable in the natural ecosystem. And I think um, part of the reason that we are so vulnerable is because we've become such bad listeners and communicators um, with our natural environment. Uh, you know, we've got sort of a, a movement where humanity, you know, we might 
believe we're the most powerful beings, you know, thinking that we own that we own land and we decide everything and economic status is everything. But, you know, it's this kind of thinking and mindset that gets us into trouble. You know, that way of thinking struggles to adapt to changing environments and, and through crisis. Um, you know, when we find out, as Naomi Klein says, uh, that we were never the boss, <laughs> I think it's true. And I think, I think now more than ever, we find ourselves questioning what really matters to us. Have we, have we built the right system with the right underlying values and beliefs uh, that will both nurture us and give us purpose for generations to come? You know, should we have been listening to the land rather than trying to own it? Should we have taken a more humble approach to our existence and place within this ecosystem instead of centering ourselves. And what does this mean, I guess, ultimately, as we begin to replicate these structures into an online environment? Um, I, I found kindred thinking uh, and inspiration um, from the work of Adrian Marie Brown, um, the author of Emergent Strategy. Uh, she talks about um, emergence and biomimicry, uh, allowing nature to inform her thinking about emergent strategy in the human world. And I, I like the emphasis on critical connections over critical mass. Um, the idea that it's the depth of relationships that determine the strength of a system not the size of it. So when you think about your interactions online and in virtual ecosystems that we're building, um, it's likely that you don't feel a depth of connection or that this virtual space is allowing you to connect deeply with our society. And when you think about technology and education and healthcare, Etc. I, I think we all wonder if gaining the power of the tool doesn't come at the cost of losing something almost intangible um, in the connection we would have formed with another person or ourselves in a slower, um, low tech process. And I don't think we fully understand the cost of these trade offs. Um, but it's not the tool, I don't think, that's the problem. Um, it's the fact that the people building all this stuff are doing it only for profit. Uh, one of the engineers of Facebook when, uh, was asked about uh, the impact on people's minds and psychology as they become addicted to social media. And, and he was quoted saying, they've never really looked into that. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just trying to get you to spend as much time on the platform as possible. So that's telling. Um, so my big question is this, uh, how might we imagine the creation of online and virtual spaces as diverse ecosystems that are built upon deep connection shared values, and an abundance of knowledge and wisdom that we all get to contribute to and benefit from. You know, and that was actually the original uh, intention of the internet. That's why it was built, and those were the underlying values of it. We've come a long way from that, but I wonder if there's not an argument to return back um, to, to, that, to that focus and to those intentions. Anyways, that, um, that's my big question. And I've spent an enormous amount of time walking alone, staring at forest systems and thinking about this and thinking about the relationship um, between these things. And I think it's helpful to think of natural systems as we think of digital systems. So uh, you've noticed here, I'm taking you with me virtually 
on a, a mini forest walk and, and see if that makes sense to you. And I'm obviously not a photographer, uh, <laughs> but these are from my actual meanderings um, while I've been working this stuff out in my mind. And I thought it would be fun uh, to share this way. Um, I've never done anything like this. Um, so if it doesn't, if it doesn't work out, we'll just, we'll just never talk about it again. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, so who am I and why do I get to take up 20 minutes of your time talking about the internet? <laughs> That's a fair question. Um, uh, I just wanted to share a little bit uh, about my background. Um, I grew up in a, in, a, in a logging family. I spent my childhood in uh, Haida Gwaii, living in a logging camp there called Sewell Inlet. And uh, I'm an only child. Um, so I spent a lot of time on my own, which if you get to know me, that starts to make sense. <laughs> but I spent a, a, a lot of time waiting for my dad to come home from the woods. Um, my dad's been a huge influence in my life. He's a residential school survivor and one of the most resilient and interesting people I've ever met. And um, although he didn't go through high school, he's uh, super passionate about education. Uh, he loves to read. Um, he reads literally all day, every day. Um, and I'm so lucky that from about two onward, he spent so much time with me teaching me how to read as well. And I'm so thankful for it. It made me uh, definitely a more confident student, which it turned out I would need later in life when I stood out as one of, if not always the only First Nations person in most classrooms that I was in. And um, I can see that that could have been exceptionally more difficult than it was. Um, and I think that's what he was preparing me for, although he never said it. But yeah, sometimes I dreaded the reading assignments and math flashcards he made me do all throughout my childhood. <laughs> but uh, it was mostly fun. And like I say, I, I'm grateful to this day. I think um, uh, his influence definitely helped me develop a growth mindset and also a love of uh, reading and talking about ideas, especially big ideas. Um, and I got so confident at one point around around uh, 10 or 11 that I thought I would be an astronaut <laughs> and I would stare out my uh, my bedroom window for hours every night thinking about going to the moon. Um, I begged my parents to send me to NASA uh, space camp for kids. I was uh, quite convinced that it was only a matter of time that I was going to go to space, so it might as well be um, uh, you know, sooner the better, <laughs> but I, I loved space then. I love space now, the idea of space travel. Uh, I don't know if you can see right behind me, there's, uh, you know, um, little photos of the moon in different phases, but it's, it's, uh, definitely still part of my life and fascination. Uh, yeah, later, later that sort of translated into an interest in physics and then, onto other sciences, kind of biology, chemistry, but unfortunately I wasn't really gifted at it as a student. I found myself a liberal arts student not long after that, kind of thriving much more in philosophy and sociology, um, thinking about the connection between nature and science, humans, plants, animals, that always fascinated me. And uh, still to this day, I find myself in this spot you see on the far right there, um, that's my favorite Riverside meditation spot and, uh, you know, thinking about how all this connects and will become somehow intertwined with our virtual future is, uh, you know, something I still think a lot about, but uh, not necessarily as a, as a scientist, but maybe more as a philosopher. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do think about all those lessons I've learned along the way from my dad, you know, while we lived in that tiny logging camp and had to understand how to live in balance with that kind of sometimes a harsh environment um, in Haida Gwaii and, you know, the, the ways in which we had to be mindful of our place and our vulnerability 
um, with black bears everywhere and storms for weeks and no real uh, communication to the outside world. Um, I, I think that experience has always informed me in some very deep and profound way. And I think for me, it's all about bringing forward some of that tacit knowledge about how vulnerable we all really are and dependent we are uh, on our relationships to things. So I, I'm trying to bring that into the work I'm doing and things I'm trying to create in terms of building resilience through relationships. And um, I hope that's starting to shine through more in my work. And yeah, I mean, also great lessons growing up around loggers. <laughs> I think that taught me a lot about how to stand my ground later in life at every boardroom table. You know, as Joe puts it, those kind of hell no moments. Uh, it's hard to intimidate a girl that grew up around huge men with chainsaws. I mean, a guy in a suit with a bad attitude somehow doesn't seem that intimidating after that. Um, next slide, please, Mark. Yeah, so, yeah, well, so along along those lines, uh, we do have to question, you, you know, why have we, why have we organized ourselves this way? Like, how did we get to the place where trying to have a voice and a new perspective about technology and our future is somehow threatening to those holding power. I mean, by that, I mean, telecommunications companies and big tech companies and, and governments. you know, why, why wouldn't we challenge this status quo that frankly, it's not serving anybody really. Um, and to my earlier point, why, why do only some communities get connected to infrastructure? Why do we value some people's ideas over others? You know, why, why do we collectively accept things the way that they are when it comes to this digital ecosystem? And I, I think a part of it is just the distance between us and where these decisions are being made. Um, to me, it's like thinking about, and that's why I chose this photo, but it's like thinking about the biggest tree you've ever seen. You know, you can barely see the top of it from the ground. It's clearly been there for a long time, taking all the sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if all the decisions were being made up there in the top branches, you know, there's really no way of, for you to get up there or yell up there to have any conversation. And I think this is the case when it comes to achieving digital equity in Canada. Uh, you know, we're, we're down here looking up, trying to figure out how all that works and how to create an ecosystem where we all thrive under this canopy because the answer is not to remove these big trees you know i.e companies and governments but rather how can we get them to be part of our communities and a part of a better future for all of us you know, empowering us to be a part of the design of our own digital destiny instead of dominating over everything and allowing only those that can pay the highest rates to survive. I think this is the answer. Uh, next slide, please, Lord. This is the answer, I think. We think like fungus. <laughs> My goal for all us Indigenous peoples and allies uh, in this space is to become the mycelium of the forest floor. We create an expansive network by connecting our roots together. So our network could be one of the biggest <laughs> underground formations in this country. Um, if I'm losing you because you haven't been nerding out on mycelia during the pandemic, it's not too late to start. <laughs> but mycelium has a number of key functions. Um, but a big one is the communications role it plays uh, across all plant species and in creating, frankly, system change. So it doesn't do this by yelling up at the top branches, but by informing the roots of these giant trees. 
So mycelia are able to pass on information about nutrients and stress in the environment and can support, you know, the big trees and the smaller species by becoming this information network that is critical in how the whole ecosystem adapts to change. So when I think about how we as individuals and smaller organizations affect change and help the whole ecosystem to become resilient, adaptive, and in deep connection and relationship with one another, um, whether that be in our physical or virtual world, I think the answer is to focus on these relationships and how our network of powerful relationships can influence how and what we build in the future. We be the mycelium. <laughs> um, next slide, please, Mark. So just to close, um, I'd like to say that as we catapult into a new virtual reality, I hope we never lose sight of our own humanity and our deep and meaningful connection to our natural environments and all the things we can learn from it if we listen. And if I were to choose the leaders and coders of these new worlds uh, that we are creating, I would certainly want some of them to be the wisdom keepers, um, the knowledge holders, and the foremost experts on complex systems adaptation, the people that have advanced innovation and technology on these lands since time immemorial. And if that resonates with you, um, please do uh, join us at the First Nations Technology Council and the movement we're creating to ensure indigenous peoples and all of us uh, have a voice and have a seat at the tables that will be making these decisions and uh, designing that future. So thank you. Thank you again for having me. Haichka, uh, I'm muted. I love the analogy with the mushrooms. That was so wonderful. Um, I'm wondering, could you repeat that question also that you said about halfway through your talk about how you might imagine the creation of virtual spaces? thought that was such a, um, I forget, I don't, maybe you don't remember the question, but the, the question that you've been meditating on as, as you're walking about how we imagine the creation of virtual spaces that are built on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you remember? Sorry, as, as usual, my, um, <laughs> my internet is slow, of course. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, how we might, imagine the creation of online and virtual spaces as diverse ecosystems um, that are built upon deep connection, shared values, and an abundance of knowledge and wisdom that we all get to contribute to and benefit from. Thank you. That's such a wonderful question. Um, we're going to move into um, a Q&A um, from members of uh, the community who are here with us today. So I'd love to invite folks to enter questions, any questions that they have for Denise into the chat or raise your hand um, and we will find you um, in, the, in the audience and highlight you so that you can ask a question. And maybe while those questions are coming in, I actually thought of a I thought of a poem while you're reading, while you're while you're speaking that that um, I sort of wanted to share with you. That's it's by Margaret Atwood awesome. from this this book um, called Poetry Pharmacy, and it's Poetry Pharmacy. There was this person who went around. Um, his name is William Seagart, and he gave um, people shared their ailments, and then they um, their emotional ailments and prescribed them poetry. <laughs> And he did this thing around, and he wrote this poem called The Moment by um, Margaret, At or sorry, Margaret Atwood wrote this poem called The Moment that is um, 
for career obsession, thirst for ownership and possessiveness. And it made me think about it when you were talking about ownership. So while people are sending in their questions, I'd love just to share the poem with you. Um, the moment when after many years of hard work and a long voyage, you stand in the center of your room, house, half acre, square mile, island, country, knowing at last how you got there and say, I own this, is the same moment when the trees unloose their soft arms from around you, the birds take back their language, the cliffs fissure and collapse, the air moves back from you like a wave and you can't breathe. No, they whisper, you own nothing. You were a visitor time after time, climbing the hill, planting the flag, proclaiming, we never belonged to you. You never found us. It was always the other way around. That's beautiful. Which definitely speaks more, I mean, it speaks to me as, as a settler um, in these lands and yeah. Christine, yeah. we have a we have a first Thank question you. from Tariq, who's joining us from Oman. But before that, I'm going to read this question from Pavel uh, Ganapolsky. He asks, "Are there some links that we can share with everybody to get involved, Denise? Is it just should we send what What's the best place for people to learn how to get involved and support your your work?" Yeah, um, just technologycouncil.ca is our website. You can find links to all of um, the current work that we have going on, our social media, and something we're really excited about that's going to be uh, launched in a couple of months here, hopefully, is going to be um, a fairly large um, op um, uh, new mode campaign where we're going to be making... Uh, national statement around digital equity and the rights of indigenous people to access uh, this infrastructure and determine uh, how we want to see technology integrated into our communities as part of our, uh, you know, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And it'll be as easy as just, uh, you know, putting in your postal code and uh, you'll, you'll be given a letter that will be sent to some of the representatives that we think are really key um, in, in making these decisions. So we're about to launch that, but you'll find that on our website in the next couple of months. So checking in there is, is really helpful. Great. We have another question from uh, Joanne. Um, oh, sorry, Tariq is up. Perfect, never mind. Yeah, Denise, thank you very much, first of all, for the presentation, really appreciate it. Um, just a more a personal question, but I think maybe everyone can benefit from it. So if you would give one advice on one advice on how to have a balance between a virtual life and uh, like a real life, if that makes sense, to create a balance <laughs> for our life, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I'm trying to work that out too, because I, I, I feel like I get asked all the time, you know, as someone who is an advocate for connectivity and uh, for access to these platforms and these applications, you know, why do I always have this kind of comment about responsible use of it and have some concerns about it? And, you know, I, I think that one of the ways that um, I try to balance this, like I say, is um, I've been more structured than ever, especially through the pandemic. I've been really structured about um, taking breaks. Um, I take breaks from media, news media, uh, really often, and try to uh, limit the amount of screen time uh, that I have and go back to just regular phone calls for as many meetings as possible, um, because this, this is having an effect. Uh, you know, a lot of people are getting migraines and having uh, a lot of auditory issues. And we don't really understand the extent to what what the issues are going to be from being in in this kind of Zoom environment for 12 hours a day. So I think it's just really important to try to structure the day so that you're away from uh, technology as much as possible. Like I say, I take, you know, probably two and a half hours a day of really long walks um, just to to clear my mind and be present. So um, I, I know that's a really obvious answer, but it's, it's harder to actually do in practice. <laughs> Through the question, Joanne, I know you had a question. Did you want to ask? Uh, I'll let her ask. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any initiatives 
um, that you know of that help that help bridge a gap, that help make these um, network connections, um, specifically to uh, people that aren't really connected to nature, that would want to be and would want to learn some of the wisdom that that you've inherently had from, from your upbringing that's unique to you? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's really what we're trying to build at the Technology Council, uh, because I think uh, a lot of uh, allies have this question, you know, how do we get connected to this kind of wisdom? How do, how do we understand how Indigenous peoples are thinking about uh, these connections and how do we learn learn from that? Um, one of the issues is is because so many Indigenous people are not connected to these online spaces, these ways that we're convening now. It means that we are missing those voices and that wisdom and those teachings uh, because most of those knowledge keepers can't connect this way. So that's why we're really working hard on this infrastructure uh, piece, really trying to make sure that. Indigenous people have access, and at the same time, the, the Technology Council to date has um, scaled up just over 3,000 Indigenous people in BC uh, to be using technology, building in these virtual spaces so that we can bring our wisdom, the exact question you have, and that sort of longing for, for that kind of connection to be present for you. That's why you know, we're, we're really trying to train people up to be able to, to participate that way. Um, because it, it comes back to that, that question, um, you know, when we think about who's disconnected, you know, there's, there's a thinking that those communities are disconnected from us, but the reality is that we're disconnected from them, you know, like we're, we're disconnected from that wisdom, that knowledge, from those ways of thinking about uh, how technology and our, our physical world could, could be merged in a better way. So, you know, unfortunately the answer is we're working on that, um, but we're definitely convening more spaces through the Technology Council for these conversations. So um, yeah, again, we're holding lots of webinars and things like that where we have uh, elders and knowledge keepers from our communities coming and talking about these things. So. Uh, we also have um, a division within our organization called Sector Transformation, which is about uh, different um, tech sector or other organizations that want to get closer to this work and want to do some decolonizing work and understand uh, how to, how to uh, transform their own organizations or themselves as individuals and entrepreneurs. Um, we're, we're currently uh, being funded to do some of that work. So if that's of interest, reach out uh, to us at the Tech Council. We're, we're building a great group of facilitators uh, to be able to, to, to create that space for those discussions. Great, thank you. We have a couple thank more you. questions. Um, we have a really terrific question from Serena Renner. Serena, would you like to come on and ask this question in person? We can highlight her. Sure. Um, yeah, it's kind of kind of a long, complicated one, but um, I think it kind of builds on these last two questions about um, connection and disconnection and kind of crossing divides. Um, I was really intrigued by your upbringing on Haida Gwaii. Obviously, you have deep ancestral connections to nature, but you also were surrounded by loggers. And um, it kind of reminded me of the sponsor's initial point about the polarization we're seeing in the world. And I wonder if you have any tips for communicating or connecting with people kind of on the other side of maybe the ideological divide or yeah, kind of what is your uh, advice for finding common ground? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, again, and, and thanks for bringing it back to that piece around growing up on Haida Gwaii. My, um, my dad was the only First Nations logger in that logging camp, and um, that was not easy for him. And his whole life has been like that, you know, always being the only Indigenous person, uh, always having to find a way to communicate with people through racism, through bias. Um, and obviously, you know, that was back in the 70s and 80s, lots of um, protests going on and very difficult to be an Indigenous man 
logging your own ancestral territory and having your community not agree with your participation in that as well. And so I think I learned a lot from watching that navigation and from those conversations with him over the years. Um, but for, for me too, I mean, it, um, you know, it's not been the easiest thing to be an Indigenous woman and at the time a young Indigenous woman in the tech sector or sitting with, you know, powers, seats of government who just completely do not care about my perspective um, and trying to find that way to connect uh, can be really challenging, but it's a matter of understanding and having the self-awareness about your own ego and what what your trip lines of your own ego are, you know, and um, it's really hard in this conversation around reconciliation and the rights of Indigenous people when you see the impact of these decisions by the Crown on our communities. For me, I sit right in the middle, I see both, you know, and trying to be that translation point to government and industry about how those decisions are creating um, a really dark future for our young people, especially. This is becoming an intergenerational problem. So in me, the feeling is I can, you know, I can become furious and impatient and angry uh, with people who are the actors of this space. Um, it's taken a lot of love and acceptance and generosity that, you know, Ultimately, I believe all people are good people. And I think that some of these systems that we're working within cause us um, to have this friction. But all of these systems, all these things we've built, you know, they can be changed. And we, you know, um, as has been said, you know, the, the, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice, right? So I, I, do, I do believe that if we can love people and, and have empathy through um, and understand what is bubbling up for us in our own experience and why that's hard to be in this conversation. I think trying to, you know, ultimately um, focus on what needs to be done, to be focused on the solution um, and to be focused on what's the right solution, not just for us as people, as our human race, but for the planet and for seven generations, that can start to humble us down in that moment. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just for for me, I just, um, I really take seriously deep relationships, even deep relationships with people that I don't agree with or that don't agree with me. I, that's, all, that's all part of it. Thank you. Um, we have one final quick question, um, and um, we'll end with this one. And this one's from Marion Landers, and I'll, I'll just ask this one. And it's, is there any immediate talks to expand bandwidth in Indigenous communities with government? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, there, there's, uh, this has been going on for 10 years where government has been talking about uh, multi-million dollar, you know, $750 million envelopes. Now you'll see a $1.2 billion uh, envelope for connecting Canadians. Um, it, it's, it's really important just to understand that uh, the reason that all of those millions never end up connecting First Nations communities is because it all goes to big telecommunications companies. It's a competitive bid system um, where those big telcos are the only ones that can get in an application in sometimes a three week turnaround. Um, so that's the reality of some of these government initiatives um, to, to build out the infrastructure. Uh, so the tech council, you know, um, myself in particular, we're, we're active, uh, you know, advocates and, and really in front of um, those ministers and those people who are building these projects. Um, and what we're doing now is we're asking for them to do um, uh, quarterly evaluation of their programs so that we're not waiting to the end to say, oops, uh, that didn't benefit any First Nations communities. Uh, we're asking for on a quarterly basis uh, for them to be accountable to us about how this money is supporting our communities. And you'll, you'll notice that there's no Indigenous people 
um, around the the, the uh, design of those programs. And there's no Indigenous people in the adjudication of those applications. So even if they do get an application from an Indigenous community, they have no one there that can really contextualize it or understand it. So this is this is a big this is a big issue in this country where you see government programming, government initiatives, um, uh, feeding for-profit telecommunications companies that have no accountability to us. They only have accountability to their own shareholders. So that's what I mean. That system will never create equality, and that's why you know we the people really have to work together to figure out you know where can we find. Uh, uh, money for change, resources for change. And I think the philanthropic space is really promising um, while we push on government. And, uh, you know, obviously I've been talking a lot about launching an Aboriginal rights and title case uh, to Spectrum for Spectrum sovereignty. So Indigenous people actually own Spectrum. So we're outside of this mess and we can build our own, uh, build our own stuff. So that's something I'm sort of up to. Um, but I, I don't think the answer is ever going to be government initiatives or contribution agreements. The government will not fund the revolution. So, you know, we have to find other ways to do it.